Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host for tonight's pre-concert presentation, Jim Branscombe of Cinematic Void! Like this, I've never read a script like this before. I mean, it's a very, she's right. 
it's a great throwback to the 1950s, like sci-fi movies, and I mean, it's fun, and that's how it all filmed. So how did Rope to You end up becoming part of this movie? Wow. Uh, like, it was actually, you know, like most films, I mean, I don't think, both of us were working actors at the time, I don't think, you know, we were, yeah, I don't think we were like pushing away scripts like crazy, so we actually went in and auditioned at least a half a dozen times. Uh, they were matched, they matched us up with a whole lot of different people, so every time we would go in, there would be, you know, I think it started out like, you know, 25 people, and there would be a smaller, smaller group, but they'd mix and match us with pairs, and they were kind of find the right, uh, Chemistry between Grant and I and John. Yeah. So, now Grant, your character is based on a real person that he is named Mike Tobacco. Right. What kind of backstory did they give you for that? I, you know, not not that much other than the fact that he was he was their buddy growing up, and uh, and he was always uh, he was always getting in, in trouble. He was always uh, you know doing things he wasn't supposed to be doing. And, and, <laughs> um, I think it was kind of loosely based upon that guy. But so, they had an idea, the Peter brothers had a really strong idea of what they wanted every scene to look like, every character to play. Um, and, uh, you know, it was really, at the time I was, you know, you know trying to be a serious thespian and, and taking all sorts of acting classes, so, and this was completely different than anything. So I just went with what Stephen wanted me to do. You know, he said, go big, go, you know, go frantic. Because he really, they, all the brothers, they knew what they, what they wanted. They wanted these characters to kind of be reminiscent of the movies that they loved growing up. Now, Suzanne, your character was allegedly flipped on the normal stereotype at the time of being the dumb blonde. Instead, Mike Tobacco got to be the dumb blonde. What did you think about that flip? That's right. I know. I was, I was studying to be a paleontologist. My character. <laughs> Which brings so. up one of the best, the best props in the movie. It's a little thing, it's the dinosaur earring. My dinosaur earring. <laughs> you know what ever happened to that? Uh, Steve Pianza said he was just looking at it the other day, so maybe he's got it. I don't know. Should have worn it tonight. <laughs> So, working on a film like this, which is very effects heavy, like, at what point did you see, like, start seeing the effects in operation, like the clown and that kind of thing? Well, ironically, it's effects heavy, but, I mean, I think one of the reasons that most people love the movie is it's not a lot of CGI and stuff in it. I mean, it's, uh, it was almost, all, I mean, all the clowns were sculpted by the Kyotos and built in their, in their, uh, workshop and, um, you know, all those sets and everything that you see in the movie were all hand painted. Um, they, you know, built by hand in a big warehouse up in Santa Cruz and painted by hand. Um, you know, obviously some of those little electronic ray gun things and stuff like that were, but cotton candy cocoons, I mean, everything was built, everything was made. There was a person in every one of those clown suits. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was basically, you got. You got <laughs>
Um, you know, I was I drove to Hollywood Boulevard and, and watched it at the theater and uh, and enjoyed it. And you know, the funny thing was is that the movie the movie kind of you know kind of came and went fairly quickly back then. <coughs> You didn't really have straight to home video releases, so things were released in the theater even if it was for a short period of time. <laughs> and uh, so it was very strange because you know I had done kind of another cult movie, uh, not too far apart, a cult movie called Hard Bodies. And Hard Bodies. Yeah. Hard Bodies is great. <laughs> But but Hard Body is like it had a big it had a big cult life before and Killer Clowns was like the tortoise and that was the hare and Hard Bodies kind of came out of the gate and became you know with with, uh, with Cinemax and all the, the the play and everything it became popular but Killer Clowns just kind of like kept on coming and Hard Bodies kind of slowly started to drift down and Killer Clowns I mean I think Killer Clowns is more popular today thirty years later than it has ever been in its lifetime. I mean, it has not ever stopped. <laughs> what, what I found meeting people that love the movie is people teach their kids to watch the movie, and their kids teach their kids to watch the movie. So you'll be meeting three generations of people that love to watch from outer space. And it's just been a really interesting experience. It's, uh, it's an interesting phenomenon, this movie. Well, sure. the trip about Killer Clowns is that the, you know, the killers you know, kind of called the kills candy-coated kills. Yeah. So a lot of people try to call it a horror movie. It's really not a horror movie. It's kind of, a, it's kind of its own unique you know, sci-fi. It's a spoof, but it's not a spoof. You know what I mean? It's an homage, in a way, right? Um, so uh, it's, 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 it's kind of very unique and works on its own merits in a lot of ways, which I think is one of the reasons why it's stayed around as long as it, as it has, is because there's really nothing else like it. So, uh, so I met someone tonight that said they would come home drunk with their friends, <laughs> and they had two movies they would watch every time. Killer Clown Survivor's Place and Casablanca. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to process that. Well, I, 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 it's a true story, but I actually, I actually texted Peter Chris from Kiss and asked him if he happened to be in town, if he or any of the guys from Kiss wanted to come to the show, because, um, like, I've got famous fans like that. that the Kiss has, he has watched this movie on every single concert tour to this day that they've ever been on. They never go without this, according to Kiss. Wow. Adam Rifkin can probably verify that since he <laughs> so, I'll do one more question here. Uh, when did you guys start realizing this movie had one leg? Like, was there a point that people just start going, to I'm okay, it's talk about the movie, or was it just like out of the blue? It was a slow burn up. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I would say I started knowing about what was going on maybe about eight years ago. Because I live up north and I, I am not really in the entertainment business anymore. And um, I started getting these Facebook um, messages and it was kind of just a surprise. <laughs> I, I had kind of a, a funny experience, you know, I, I, I became a producer some years back and, and I was, one of the, the earlier things I was doing was I was making, I was producing a cooking show. And one, one, one chef that, uh, you know, was too important to, to show up to the normal audition, he said, you know, you can come and make visual effects out so I work at, you know, see me on your own. So I knocked on the door of this visual effects house, and the guy opened the door, and I had the camera in front of my face, so you couldn't see my face. And I just started talking to him on the camera. And without, without uh, seeing my face, he said, Oh my God, oh my God, are you Mike Tobacco? <laughs> and he's right there. <laughs> and, and then I got a call, a random call on my, on my answering machine that said, uh, can, you know, hey, I got your number from somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, and, uh, you know, can you go to a convention and sign on? Like, it was kind of a slow 
wrap up. So we talked about them already. I guess we should bring them out. Who wants it? We're going to bring out Stephen Kyoto, Charlie Kyoto, Edward Kyoto, the creators of Philippine. <laughs>
wife, Linda Kiono, who is I go, what would they want? I'm like, 
bring something, like bring music or something. So I bought some music and I met a collection of people that that had the um, had the love for the film that I did when I originally created it. Because when I originally created it, it was kind of like reliving my boyhood. Uh, my first experience going to see a, a triple feature. And I, I had this sense of wonderment, of creativity, and I didn't know what it was. Later, that it was music, and this movie, and working with the brothers was like being in my old neighborhood, and we were working on some really cool, crazy project that we liked. And so, I met people that kind of reminded me of this. They, they understood the music, they, they, they said, You know, the music, even though it's like wacky, weird, colorful synthesizer sounds, I can tell that it's very classical, that there's themes, and there's, and like, I go, well, Yes, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, Bill Bagley, who uh, we have a dedication to him on the program, he um, passed away, and he said, you know, did you ever think of actually performing it with an orchestra? And that's where the idea came. I figured, that, there's that many people that love this film. We can present it in a new way uh, that's, it, that's, uh, that the fans would enjoy it, and maybe it might inspire something else besides what we have tonight, which we'll probably, we'll announce if you have people that haven't come yet, call them in, because they're only going to hear the announcement. I'm getting the signal that we got to wrap things up. Yes. I just want to make one point. The Indian Killer Clowns is so good. Spielberg already for Indiana Jones and Crystal Stall. <laughs> That's the difference. But I want to thank everyone here, and we're going to take a brief intermission, and then we're going to get into the concert, right? Oh, absolutely. We have a special guest who cannot be here, and I think you might recognize him. We're going to play uh, a video, and he's uh, a brother. We really wish he could be here. Yeah. He's like, like a brother to me still for today. Yeah. So if we can roll that uh, that video, please. Oh, asshole. Oh, hey all you Killer Clowns fans, it's Michael Siegel here, a.k.a. Rich Terenzi. Three oh, years, wow. Now I know what you all were thinking. My God, he looks exactly the same. <laughs> it looks all like clean clown living I've been doing with my wife, Daisy. Yeah, I married her. You know, I still have a thing for big lose. Anyway, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there to celebrate the 30 year anniversary with you guys. It's just that uh, Daisy keeps sucking my blood through a crazy straw like it's chocolate milk. I had a great time on the set with the Kyoto brothers, Suzanne, Grant, John, and of course my partner in ice cream, Peter Lacasse. Anyway, have a great time tonight, you guys. Really wish I could be there. And just remember, in space, no one can eat ice cream. <laughs> She's got me trapped here, man. I've been here for so long. I'm losing a lot of blood. Call somebody. Please get me out of here. 